Info. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. Well, I'd rather do it on camera. No. no, 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 no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you had? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Hello there and welcome. I'm Rosanna Lockwood. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. This is prime time where we bring you all the stories that matter on the show tonight. Home Secretary Suella Bravman's political future hangs in the balance as the fallout from her explosive article accusing the Met Police of bias over protesting continues. And some hope at last. Israel agrees to daily four-hour humanitarian pauses in northern Gaza, giving civilians a chance to flee to the south. And as the world's largest insurance market pledges more than £50 million over the central role in their slave trade, could it be a moment of reckoning for the City of London? Plus, we'll bring you our nightly panel looking at other stories making headlines today with consumer affairs expert Harry Kind and former editor of City AM, Christian May. This is Primetime. Well, how do you solve a problem like Suella? That is once again Rishi Sunak's dilemma today, a row caused by the Home Secretary once again making Westminster dance to her tune and again turning the conversation to what might be her own leadership ambitions. Today, it's because she used the pages of The Times to make the incendiary accusation that senior police officers play favourites, saying they're happy cracking down on right-wing protesters while letting pro-Palestine or Black Lives Matter demonstrators off. After some toing and froing, Downing Street admitting Suella Braverman's words were, quote, not cleared by number 10, once again her colleagues wondering if this time it'll finally be enough for the Prime Minister to sack her. The Home Secretary's allies say she's making arguments many will sympathise with, but it's clear she is not helping her party. New polling revealing Labour's leaders now more than double the Tory vote. And Bravman's own numbers not brilliant either, with the opposition using her comments as a stick to beat the Prime Minister. He must know that this isn't the way in which a Home Secretary should behave. He must know in himself that the role of responsible government is to reduce tension and to support the police in difficult decisions that they have to make. He's got a, a Home Secretary who's, who's out of control and he is too weak to do anything about it. That's the worst of all combinations. So where does this leave things? In attempts to cancel what Suella called a hate march, Westminster has once again turned a serious row into a soap opera. Tensions are now higher than ever. The police are now furious and the march is still going ahead. Joining me in the studio is Home Affairs commentator Danny Shaw and The Sun's deputy political editor Ryan Saby. Thank you, gentlemen. Look, Ryan, I'll, I'll start with you. A lot has happened today. It's really snowballed, in fact. I mean, regarding the latest, what do you think is happening in Downing Street? Downing Street tonight will be really mulling over whether they decide to hang on to her or they really just push her out the door. It's really, really tense in there. They'll be thinking, but they'd have been thinking about it ever since last night when they found out that she defied number 10 by pressing ahead with that, that, um, that comment piece in The Times. So they'll be working out whether she's better off in the tent or outside the tent. And, you know, uh, a reshuffle was sort of being mooted when they moved cabinet jobs around. We don't know specifically when, probably at some point this month. But if they do decide to move her on from the job, who would likely replace her? You've got some big names you could bring in for just the interim. Um, if you're not going to go with a really big reshuffle, someone like Sajid Javid, Dominic Raab, someone who's got that real cabinet experience. So you could have them in for a few months, or if you're really going to be brave and maybe spark a sort of middling reshuffle, maybe promote someone like Tom Tugendhat or Vicky Atkins, who's at the, uh, who's at the Treasury. Uh, we'll have to wait and see, of course. Uh, she's not had the job yet. She may still hang on. She said plenty of things in the past. There have been plenty of rows. But uh, let's wait and see. Danny, coming to you, I mean, you've covered the Home Affairs beat for quite a long time. We talked yesterday on this show about how being a Home Secretary is never really a popular job. But have you ever seen a situation like this? I have seen some situations like this. Um, do you remember Amber Rudd mm -hmm. uh, clinging on to her job um, because of uh, a, a row about the borders and so on? 
uh, in the wake of the Windrush crisis, and then eventually she had to go. Um, then we had Priti Patel and the bullying uh, claims. And you remember Boris Johnson saying he was going to stick with Priti in the Commons. Uh, and despite the finding that she had, um, she had been guilty of bullying, she stayed in her job. Um, and we've seen rows between Metropolitan Police Commissioners and Home Secretaries before. I mean, Priti Patel and Cressida Dick, um, you know, that got pretty fractious at times as well. So this kind of comes with the territory, but I think what is different here is Home Secretary actually criticising senior police officers essentially for favouring one side over another. Mm. Now, in private, you may have a conversation about your approach to a particular demonstration, but to write an article, you know, this isn't an off-the-cuff interview, to write an article in The Times um, basically saying that um, is a really serious accusation for a Home Secretary to make, and I think that's why her position is really at risk at the moment, on top of the inflammatory statements that she's made about hate marches, which has made everyone's life and, every, and the police's job a lot more difficult this weekend approaching the Armistice Day uh, protests. What do you make of uh, sort of the assertion that she might be using the role of Home Secretary to sort of audition for a leadership role somewhere at some point? I don't know what's going on in her head. I really don't know. I'm, you know, I'm puzzled. I mean, when she talked about homelessness being a lifestyle choice, which has not gone down well, um, you know, I mean, what's that about? That surely, that's not a leadership bid, is it? When she talks about an invasion, um, you know, uh, in, in terms of the small boats crisis, you know, some months ago, is that about leadership or is that just about her, what she really feels and what she thinks other people feel and just being willing to say it? Um, when she talks about woke policing, which mm. seems to be an obsession of hers, mm. is that a leadership bid or is that just this is someone who wants to say it as it is? I don't know what goes on in her brain, quite frankly. I'm not sure any of us do. Well, let's bring Ryan back in on that point then, because when you hear that argument, people say, well, she speaks for a uh, quote-unquote silent majority, uh, whether or not they're a majority, the polling for the Conservatives off the back of some recent uh, events not looking too positive. But is it a sort of a splintering away from conservatism? I think so. And also, I think this issue is all about party management. She went for the leadership um, this time last year, and she's got 30 or 40 MPs who really are on her side. So what does Rishi Sunak want to do? Does he really want to create a headache every single day of all these people trying to pick holes in his government? And he's going to have that for the next year before this you know, general election is held. It, it, yeah, absolutely. And there's still a lot of time. You know, and could he make it back if there is a reshuffle, if there is something else happening? I mean... In terms of the demonstrations happening this weekend, we're going to have a bit more conversation about this shortly, Danny, but just wanted to get your views on this because we're, she's ended up back at the square root of nothing from her efforts. Yeah, I mean, she clearly wanted to sign an order banning any marches this weekend. She made that pretty clear. Um, and in doing so, she really put the police in a difficult position. So Mark Rowley said, we haven't reached the threshold where we can apply for a ban. But even if he did apply for a ban, she's almost ma made it an impossible situation because she has to take a decision that's legally watertight, but she's prejudged it. So that was really unwise from a legal point of view. She has drawn attention to the events this weekend. Describing uh, it as hate marches is obviously has antagonised people on, on the far right who will come into London and make it into, you know, a, a worse spectacle than it perhaps otherwise would have been. And she's in effect in a position where if there is trouble, she will just blame the Met Police and say, well, I told you you should have banned it. Mm. Uh, but other people will blame her for stoking it up. Uh, I mean, it is not a position that a Home Secretary needs to be in. What a Home Secretary should be doing over the last few weeks is calming tensions, mm. trying to bring communities together. I really believe that, that that should have been the job of a Home Secretary. I, I was no fan of Theresa May, let me, let me tell you that, and she did some really damaging things for policing, in my view. But I can't believe that she as Home Secretary would have acted as Suella Braverman has acted over the past few weeks. Well, we're going to have a further conversation about policing shortly. I want to thank you both, Danny Shaw and Ryan Saby. Thanks so much for making time. Well, as we have heard, this row is reverberating across Westminster and beyond. In a moment, we're going to speak to Conservative MP Alexander Stafford. But first, let's go to former Scotland Yard Superintendent Nusrit Metab. Uh, Nusrit, thanks for making time from home this evening. And talking of home, what did you make of the Home Secretary's accusations in her Times piece? 
Oh, wow, it's absolutely bizarre. And you've described it as a soap opera. It certainly is that with Suella being the main character, really is becoming the Suella show. Um, well, I, you know, I think she's just ramped up her criticism of Mark Rowley because he's resisted her calls to ban that march. And, you know, when you read her Times article, you do have to kind of step back and think, this is really bizarre. What is she, it's everything. It's a combination of everything, accusing them of being weak and being afraid of, you know, of getting a lot of flack and therefore just making those decisions. The thing is, what she's, I mean, this has been going on for a while now because she's been interfering. She's breaking down that British policing model. You know, she's going against the constitution and she's been interfering slowly for a while, but she's got away with it, got to say, because she's kind of, you know, talking about stop and search and how she wanted that ramped up. She was then going on about arresting every shoplifter um, and various other things that she's done. Now she's kind of blurred the lines. Her role is about setting policy, setting strategy. And Mark Rowley's role is more tactical, operational, but she wants to kind of almost make that decision and she wants him as her lapdog. It hasn't worked, so she's turned and become really, you know, angry because he's not uh, uh, done what she wanted. But he couldn't. And I, you know, I have been criticising the police a lot, actually, when it, they need to be, and it's been holding them to account. But I've got to say that I do admire him. This is the right choice because there is no other choice. He's got to work within the legislation within the law mm -hmm. and he's not going to break that law because as Danny's quite rightly said if he does there'll be a challenge a judicial review and he's got to produce the evidence the intelligence to say why that man need, uh, ban sorry march needs to be banned he can't justify mm -hmm. that and also this you know operational independence that's what the british model of policing is on and um, he can't walk away from that otherwise his role will just be a mouthpiece. And it's a real dark day for Britain if that, you know, the operational decisions are made by the Home Secretary with the mouthpiece as a commissioner. What I mean, what is policing if you don't have the law, right? I mean, <laughs> look, Nazareth, uh, what else do you make of the comments that she made about bias within policing when it comes to demonstrations, favourable treatment given to, you know, she said Black Lives Matter protesters or pro-Palestine demonstrators over and above, uh, quote-unquote, far-right demonstrators? Well, look, when you're policing a demonstration, it's about public order commanders will look at the intelligence, they will look at the risk, the assessment, and each protest will be dealt differently based on all those factors. You can't go out and deal with every single protest in the same way. If there's intelligence and you know protesters are, are becoming more violent, they will be dealt with in a particular way. I mean, you know, this about uh, Black Lives Matter being treated differently, and uh, a police bias or favoring certain groups, certain left-wing groups, tell that to reclaim the streets when they were doing their visual. I'm sure that they would disagree with that. So the bias and the favoritism, they're just her words. She is stoking community tensions for her own benefit, but there is no benefit really in this because the language that she's using is just turning, it is just leading to a cultural war which is what she wants. Is that what she really wants? It seems like it from the surface, but that will do uh, conservatives nobody any good. If it's because they want to reach the far right of the party and, you know, that's the only hope of winning the election, then is that what she's doing? But I, I think only Suella can answer that question. For me, policing is done in a fair proportionate way and within the law. And that's what how protests are policed. Referring to them as hate marches, I mean, what denotes a hate march? How do how does she define it? So all the you know, there's 150,000 plus people at one march. Are they all? Um, is she defining every single person and a hate march? Are they all haters? Mm -hmm. Who you know? How do you do that? And I think that's the right decision to allow this march to go on on Saturday. It couldn't be more appropriate. Mm. There's a disconnect between the public and uh, the Conservative Party. There's people who feel powerless. They're seeing um, the tsunami of public suffering that's going on in Gaza at this moment, and they just want to use their voice to say, stop the war. Well, what could be more appropriate than to do that on the 11th of November? 
I don't think is disrespectful. I think it's absolutely right. Those people are there um, exercising their democratic right to uh, assembly and protest, mm -hmm. and that should be honoured. Those people who made those sacrifices would, would you know, be horrified at what she's, uh, what Suella Braverman would like to do. Well, we have been speaking to people uh, across the spectrum of opinions all week here on the show. Some people, it must be said, do not want the demonstration to go ahead this weekend. Some people have no problem with it. We've spoken to former service people, we've spoken to politicians, we've now spoken to you, former Met Police Superintendent Nisrit Mittab. We really appreciate your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's bring in our other guest on this, Alexander Stafford MP, Conservative MP, standing by for us. Um, and Alex, you've listened to that entire conversation mm. now. As a Conservative MP, uh, what do you make of what's happened in the last 24 hours regarding Suella Bravman's comments and her Times piece? Well, I think, just think this is a lot of hot air over nothing, to be honest. I think what the Home Secretary is doing is doing what she should be doing, which is speaking for the people. And the majority of people do not want, uh, and polling shows this, uh, do not want a march to go, any sort of march, frankly, past the Senate half, near the Senate half on Armistice Day. She's just saying what a lot of people are thinking. And a lot of people are so frustrated with the Met Police and the way they have been handled, or rather lack of handling, all the protests regarding the Israel-Gaza conflict and the d double standards that are clearly there. She's just saying what people are seeing every day. And it is completely frustrating. The Met have not stepped up, have not dealt efficiently and quickly enough with a lot of the people who have been spewing a lot of hate on these marches. Well, that's the other side of the coin that we were just talking about there in response to uh, what our former guest was saying, Nusrit Mittab. Uh, look, uh, to clarify as well, the demonstrators say they aren't going near the Cenotaph um, and the, on these Armistice Day demonstrations on Saturday. Look, I want to talk to you a bit more about what's happening inside the party itself because polling Labour well out in her ahead. At the moment, is Sunak in charge or is Suella? Well, clearly the Prime Minister in charge. He's doing a very good job of being in charge. Uh, but it also it's clear that Suella, as the Home Secretary, is saying how she sees it. And she obviously has the meetings with the Met Police. She sees what's happening. We see what's happening. I mean, the contrast between some of these marches compared to what the Met Police did to the Sarah Everard uh, protests, absolutely disgraceful what they did to the Sarah Everard protest. They came on hard on certain protesters, and they're basically giving other ones a clear sort of pass. Now, you've heard our guests talking about the need for independence between government and policing, that line that has to be kept. You know, our last guest talking about the fact you can't have government acting as a mouthpiece for the police and trying to have that control. And we have seen that in action this week. Rowley went to meetings at Downing Street and he stood his ground. So with what you're suggesting, with the way that policing is going, do you agree in that independence? Of course, we agree in the police independence, but we also need to call out when clearly the independence isn't there. And I would say the police are not acting independently. They're not acting without bias and they're not treating everyone equally. So you absolutely uh, uh, mirror everything that uh, Suella Braverman is saying within her piece. So then when you say it's been a lot of hot air about nothing today in Downing Street, there has been a lot of dissent. A lot of your colleagues have come out and criticised Braverman for her comments, have distanced herself from them. It must be said Rishi Sunak did not do that. Uh, but this investigation into how that piece was able to be published when 10 Downing Street asked for edits, I mean, what do you make of all that? Well, clearly there needs to be collective responsibility, and I'm not part of your party to the conversation have between the Home Secretary and her team and the Prime Minister and his team about what or not in the article. I think let them have that look, and then let's see where we are after that. So I think other anything else is just speculation and hot air. What do you make of the concept that Suella Braverman could indeed be positioning herself for a leadership bid at some point? I don't see that at all. I think clearly the party is is united behind the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister will be leading us into the next general election. I don't think anyone is positioning, as you, as you say. Uh, if she was uh, positioning, not that you're saying that she is, but would you back Suella Braverman as a leader of your party? I don't think there will be a leadership election for a very long time, because I believe the Conservatives will win, and under Rishi, we will win the next general elections. There will not be a leadership election for an awful long time, so it's something that haven't entertained. Alexander Stafford, MP, we really appreciate you joining us this evening as well. Thank you. Well, next here on Primetime, we'll bring you the latest on the Israel-Gaza conflict, where a mass exodus from northern Gaza is underway as thousands more Palestinians flee south in search of safety.
welcome back. You are watching Primetime with me, Rosanna Locke, with the latest now from the Israel-Hamas conflict. A mass exodus from northern Gaza, as thousands more Palestinians continue to try to flee south in search of some safety. An evacuation corridor has reopened again today in central neighborhoods in Gaza City. It means pauses in fighting are supposed to allow people out and humanitarian aid in. Israel insists it is not a ceasefire, but there are concerns the area these people are moving to are rapidly running out of space and supplies. Meanwhile, Israeli forces are said to be surrounding Gaza City, where the fighting is intensifying. The military this evening saying it looks like its campaign is working, but it is ready for a long war. This all comes as the armed wing of the Palestinian group Islamic Jihad in Gaza says it is preparing to release two Israeli hostages for humanitarian and medical reasons. My next guest is co-founder of We Are Not Numbers. It's a non-profit organization launched in 2015, which seeks to tell the stories of Palestinians living in Gaza. But more than that, he is grieving. 21 members of his family have been killed in this latest conflict. His father, his two brothers, three of his sisters, a cousin and 13 nieces and nephews, all of them children and one of them just two years old. Ahmed al Mauk joins me now in the studio. Um, I start by giving my profound condolences for what must be an unbelievable time. Not many people can understand what it's like to have so many family members killed. Um, just tell us a little bit about what the last few weeks have been like for you. Thank you very much first for having me. Um, I agree with you, not many people can understand losing 21 family members. Uh, I can't even begin to imagine or believe what's going on. I feel sometimes that I am in, in a phase of denial. I remember in 2014, I lost one brother and I was devastated. Now I lost 21 family members and actually 14 kids were killed in my home, nieces and nephews, all of them under the age of 13. What's going on and what has been happening for the past three weeks or so is a disaster. It's a catastrophe. It's a genocide that is committed against the Palestinian people. What family do you still have in Gaza? What contact are you able to have with them? Well, I have always been proud that I have a very big family. So I still have only two sisters left. I lost three sisters and two brothers and a father. But I still have two sisters left. Look, there was a, one of the reasons that invited you on to talk, Ahmed, is there was a lot of press coverage and discussion about insensitive uh, handling of a television interview you did last week on a separate network. Can I ask you if you were surprised at all by the handling of that interview or the press coverage after it? Actually, I wasn't surprised because, as you know, I'm a journalist and I have been uh, watching the Western media, Western mainstream media for a long time right now. And I know that every time that the Western media invites Palestinians to come to the studios, they would always ask, ask them these dehumanizing questions. They would always, they want to test the Palestinians uh, of their uh, of worthiness, if that their stories are worthy of being told. I was asked if uh, my brothers or my sisters were close to me. That was uh, the problem that we have been dealing with for the past 75 years. There has been a lot of media coverage on Palestine, this war, but it only became the news, only Gaza became the news when Israelis were killed. But we in Palestine have been killed for 75 years and we never had this media coverage in Palestine. For the past 17 years of punishment, we have been under many, many wars. We have lost, invites Palestinians to come to the studios. They would always ask, ask them these dehumanizing questions. They would always, they want to test the Palestinians uh, of their uh, of worthiness, if that their stories are worthy of being told. I was asked if um, my brothers or my sisters were close to me. That was uh, the problem that we have been dealing with for the past 75 years. There has been a lot of media coverage on Palestine, this war, but it only became the news, only Gaza became the news when Israelis were killed. But we in Palestine have been killed for 75 years and we never had this media coverage in Palestine. For the past 17 years in Gaza, we have been under illegal blockade, collective punishment. We have been under many, many wars. We have lost... ...nation coming out of Gaza. That's the obstacle that I'm not saying I come up against, but I think that other media organisations come up against the West. How, how do you work with that complexity in, in getting people to understand the scale of the disaster that's happening there? Well, actually, that's the problem. The, the, situa the situation in Gaza is not very complex. It's very clear. It's very simple. We are a people who live under occupation, under military occupation. We, the Palestinians, we don't have a separate state. 
It's not two major powers are fighting each other. We are the Palestinian people who live under military occupation for 75 years. We live under colonization. And Israel is the occupier. And the Palestinians are the occupied. So it's very, very simple. Now, uh, you said uh, you mentioned something about statistics and we, you cannot reach to, to people in Gaza. And that's the story in itself. Mm. Why would the Palestinians have to live this life? Starvation, lack of water, lack of food, lack of communication. Why would Israel cut the telecommunication on Gaza? It's because they don't want the Palestinians to tell their stories. It's because Israel doesn't want you to reach the Palestinians and hear their stories. We're talking about a huge figures right now. And the statistics are actually, I don't like to, tell, uh, to talk about statistics, but there are 5,000 Palestinian children who were killed in, only, uh, in, in the past one month. Every one of them has a story that deserves to be told. My 14 nieces and nephews has, has, uh, have stories that need to be told. And the people should know about these people because they're humans and their life matter. For example, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, a few days ago, I have a friend of mine. His name is Maisara, Dr. Uh, Maisara. And he came to the UK and he studied his master's at King's College. And he was staying at his, at his home. And then Israel bombed his home, killed him and killed all of his family. Until now, no one could go and retrieve the bodies of, of, them, of him and his family. Do you know what's worse? What's worse is that two of his brothers who were not at house. They went on to dig with using ba th their bare hands to retrieve the bodies of their brothers and sisters and mother and father. And then Israel even saw them, they bombed them and killed his two brothers. This is the situation we're talking about. He was a doctor, he was talented, he was an amazing person. And he started here in the UK. And he met with James Cleverly two, only two months ago. And he was killed and no one talks about him. That's the stories that deserve to be told and sh should be brought to the media. Unfortunately, in the media, we only see that I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about ma many other major human uh, ministry media. They only invite the Palestinian people to come here in order to ask them very embarrassing questions. Do you condemn Hamas? Were your brothers uh, close to you? They just want to embarrass us, but they don't want to give us our voice. They don't want to hear our real story. They never give a context mm. to the situation. They don't talk about the illegal settlements that is taking uh, place in the West Bank. They don't talk about the collective punishment of the blockade that has been ongoing for the past 17 years. They don't talk about my mother who Israel killed three years ago, not directly, indirectly, by not allowing her to receive medical treatment. They're not talking about the uh, 100 Palestinian uh, kids right now who are who have kidney failure and Israel today bombed the only the only hospital that provide dialysis for 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 the kids we are talking about a huge humanitarian crisis a catastrophe mm -hmm. on, on humanity and we need the media to take its responsibility to talk about what's actually going on to give a context to what's going on and to give the Palestinians the voice they deserve to be heard the Palestinians deserve to be to, to live they don't deserve to die in this barbaric way Ahmed um words on board it just finally while we have you you're also a londoner you live in london um these demonstrations have caused a lot of media coverage in and of themselves you've uh, what does it feel like as a palestinian living in london seeing not only the demonstrations but the coverage of them i'm actually terrified i'm actually terrified because uh, there are hundreds of thousands of people who live in london and all around the world who go and protest they protest because they want to end this genocide that's taking place in Gaza. They protest because they don't want another 5,000 Palestinian kids being killed. And then when they go to the street, with all colors, with all faiths, we have Jews, we have Christians, we have Muslims, we have atheists, we have people from all faiths, from all colors, and they all go and demonstrate and ask for one thing, a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. But I'm terrified because some politicians call these people hate marches. This is actually terrifying and it gives me a, a sense of unsafety to live in this country because why would, why would you call pe people who protest peacefully to call for a ceasefire, to call for an end to the genocide? They are hate, hate marches. It gives you an impression that these people are doing something wrong, but they are not doing wrong. These are love marches and they should continue. And everyone, this is a free country. This is a democracy. And people who want to protest against the illegality of the Israeli crimes, they should have the right to speak. Mm. They shouldn't be uh, Islam. Does it not concern you that there have been, there's been proven to be some members in the marches that have had connections to Hamas or anything else? I'm not conflating all of them in the march or all Palestinians with Hamas, of course I'm not, but there has been proof that there are some people who are not there to march for peace. Well, uh, I have some, uh, I've seen some reports that two people were 
in the last protest who said something that the government doesn't like. But you're talking of two people, but there are other 500,000 people. So this is a very, very small number, and we shouldn't generalize. These are huge masses, and, and this is a diverse country. We always, you will always find someone or two people who we don't agree with. We have been calling that these uh, protests should be peaceful, and we will always say that these protests, uh, protests should be peaceful. But there will always be exceptions. But a small, 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 small number. We shouldn't uh, like divert the conversation. These are majorly peaceful protests. They're calling for just a ceasefire. There will be one person or two people, but these don't reflect uh, the, the, the overall picture and the overall message that all of these people are calling for. And that's why we shouldn't actually focus on the, on the, on the limited number of people who does that. Ahmed al Nawuk, founder of We Are Not Numbers Palestinian Group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, next here on Primetime, Lloyds of London has announced it will pay £52 million in reparations for the significant role it played in the slave trade. We're going to ask, could it be a moment of reckoning for the City of London? Stay with us. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening. I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. <laughs> ah. Me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for this? You like, I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis? No, I am Sanz. not. Stop pandering to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the Preservation of the Habitat of the Lesser Spotted Newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's That's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> that's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. and We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle <laughs> class. Brave us here, Tess. <laughs> I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know, now you're probably going to boot me off the show after this <laughs> now. <laughs> Kevin, right. uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. Well, I'd rather do it on camera. No. no, 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 no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you had? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Next tonight, the world's biggest insurance marketplace, Lloyds of London, will put £52 million towards promoting racial equality as a form of reparations for its role in the slave trade. An 18-month review found the firm played a significant part in ensuring the trade continued, from insuring the largest slave ship owners to offering risk policies for uprisings. Its current chairman saying, quote, we are deeply sorry for this period of our history, but is it enough? Critics saying no amount of compensation will ever repair the damage already done. To discuss this, joining me in the studio, Derek Law, 
Lord. He's a former special advisor, a businessman and a bank with an extensive background in finance and commentator and friend of the show and talk TV generally, Afia Hagen. Thank you both so much for joining. Look, uh, what we're talking about here, Derek, is it's the scale. Lloyd's, it's no secret. It was a vast scale and it's a formidable corporation to be making these admissions. Yes, it most certainly is. Um, but I think that one of the things I want to foreground is that slavery wasn't peculiar to Britain. Um, in um, uh, Rome, Greece, Egypt, every, the Jews everywhere around the world uh, uh, did this. And the one thing that we've got to remember is that um, however much people apologise or however much they um, compensate, it doesn't actually, it will, it will never benefit the people that was, were enslaved. And that's not us. So you can't, obviously, yeah, you know, we can't wind back time, yeah. but we can do something now. Um, do you agree with doing something now? Well, I mean, I think that, in a way, these financial services companies, um, Lloyds, for example, should be doing these things anyway. So they should be building schools, building hospitals, doing societal things, community things. I don't think it's necessarily uh, related to um, uh, reparation payments for slavery. Um, it, it, although reparation payments and compensation payments and things of that kind are well established, we did it um, after the First World War, uh, the Germans last paid their reparations in uh, October 2010 uh, for the Second World War and so on and so forth. I s still nonetheless think that our advanced notion of human rights um, is really very different from the period of time that we are talking about and remember we've always got to remember this people are mm. creatures of their time i mean st paul mm. said slaves obey your masters mm. uh, fear i mean reparations washing it's a term that we hear mm -hmm. often is this what's happening with lloyd's I do think it is what's happening with Lloyds. Now, whereas um, if we look at the actual definition of reparations, it's about redressing gross violations of human rights. And I don't believe that reparations should just be about money. I agree with you when you said yeah. that Lloyds should be doing programmes where they um, are in communities, scholarships. scholarships, everything like that. But Lloyds also have a huge problem with their pay gap between their white and black employees, mm. which is about 21.5% difference between how much their black employees get paid and how much their white employees get paid. So they can sit over here and say they're giving this, you know, 60 million quid or whatever it is towards uh, programs and reparations and all the rest of it. But the calls are coming from within the house. Mm. Lloyds need to get their house in order if they want to seem like they are truly sorry for the part they played in slavery and are truly moving forward to a time of equality. If the employees within your own organisation, the black employees employees are being paid less than the white ones, then this is completely reparations washing. Now, I do think actually that Lloyds do need to pay something, whether that is in, you know, huge financial sums. And when we talk about reparations, the sums that could be owed to the ancestors of the enslaved Africans, to those who died and to those who were enslaved, could be in trillions. It could be incalculable, actually. Mm. You may not be able to get to a point where you, where you have a number. So it's not just about the money. It's about the actions that you take as a huge, huge organisation to address the inequalities that are a hangover from slavery and those inequalities are in healthcare, are in the police force, are in education, whether that comes to, you know, black women being four to five times more likely to die on childbirth in the six weeks after mm -hmm. than their white counterparts, or the fact that black men in London are up to seven times more likely to be stopped and searched than their white counterparts. But that doesn't have anything to do with slavery. You can't blame all our problems of today on uh, slavery, which was abolished in this country in 1833. But those things are, uh, means that because of slavery, you have these institutionalized inequalities that need to be addressed. And like I said, not just with money, but with you know community outreach programs, with trying their best to redress the balance. Does it take then an 18-month research project by John mm. Hopkins University to uh, push the hand then, Derek? To... That, 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 that's what really surprised me, that they felt that they had to commission a report to tell everybody what everybody already knows. No financial institution yeah. in this country um, will not have 
benefited at an earlier moment of time from slave uh, labour. Uh, they will know that. What I find very interesting is how they arrive at the figure um, of £53 million. Mm. Pounds. And then I also wonder, how will anybody ever know that that's the amount that they give? Uh, you need some kind of independent adjudication of this so that it's not just a public relations spin. Derek Lord, Afia Hagen, we really appreciate you both coming in. Fascinating conversation. Next, here on Prime Time, we're going to be joined by our panel this Thursday evening. We're going to be going over some other headlines at Court Eye right today. Stay with us. Back some breaking news for you now. It is being reported the ousted NatWest chief executive Dame Alison Rose, you might remember who lost her job over the Nigel Farage debanking scandal, is about to lose out on millions of compensation. The bank's board reportedly going to cancel the bulk of her £10 million payout, dropping the discretionary elements of the pay package. It's a story we've been following. We want to bring you the latest on that. Time now, though, for our primetime panel to dissect some of the other big stories of the day. Joining me in the studio, consumer affairs expert Harry Kind and former editor of City. AM. Christian May, gentlemen, thank you. Uh, let's start here, shall we? News the Hollywood actor strike is finally over after the US Actors Union agreed a deal being described as tentative with studio bosses. The 118 day walkout is the longest in Hollywood history. My question to you this evening, Harry and Christian. Harry, start you. Did you care? Did you notice? 
Uh, do you know, I'm going to notice in six months' time yes. when suddenly all the TV programmes dry up and I will be stuck watching non-scripted TV, which is what <laughs> happened in the last strikes that we had, or we will have some terrible, terrible reality shows. It's a boon for those guys, oh, look, not so great boon for us. boon for me. I do love yeah. the terrible reality show, <laughs> so I'm fine with that. But you're right, because it has yeah. caused this huge backlog. They're going to start production on a lot of movies. Now again, uh, Christian, the one that's being touted is Deadpool 3, if you're into that. Um, but, yeah, a lot of actors have been out of work for a long time and it's really affected the industry. certainly has. Normally, when you think of strike action, certainly in this country, you think of a sort of immediate impact of doctors mm. withdrawing their labour or trains not yeah. turning up. This is an unusual strike action in the creative industry in the US because, as Harry says, there's going to be this extraordinary lag where the impact of it will be seen quite a long way down the line. But I do have, some, I do have sympathy for them. If you consider the you know, extraordinary explosion in content which is now demanded by the streamers, mm. by the different studios, it's, it's been an absolute explosion in the in the demands and expectations and the, the the speed with which new series have to appear almost as soon as the last one is finished the, the pressure on writers in particular um, has always been extraordinary the, the one area where I probably don't think they they're they're going to hold off the flood for a long time is on AI and mm. they say they've mm. negotiated some protections from the AI well you know if they figured out a way to protect themselves from AI then they can tell the rest of us the secret <laughs> good yeah. point yeah, and, and you know, it, it's such an interesting shift that we've had that we as consumers have gone like, oh, well, of course we get our TV via Netflix and that happens overnight for us. The actors haven't really renegotiated contracts properly since the 60s. Mm. And when you're making a TV show back then, the big things were syndication, maybe selling it internationally. You were selling 24 episodes in America and that was a huge money spinner and that was a check that you would get, you know, every month until you died, basically, mm. if you were making a big show like Seinfeld. Now, the streamers won't necessarily tell you how, how many people watched your program. That's mm. the data they keep secret. They won't say, um, you know, this is something that we're syndicating out to other people. You're not going to make that money anymore. And so, of course, it had to change uh, because the industry changed with it. Well, let's stay on the topic of television because we've got <laughs> new data out from the ONS. It's found us Brits watch more than two hours of TV every day. Of course, you're all watching talk TV, aren't you? And we are sleeping more than we did during the pandemic. I find that surprised. And the data also found the average adult socialises for just half an hour a day. We're asking, are we really all just sort of couch potatoes? Uh, Christian, uh, the stuff since the pandemic is interesting. We are sleeping more, around nine hours a day on average. Well, I mean, I don't know who's lucky enough to bank on nine hours. And, and I think there's, a, there's probably a relationship between the figures on, on, on sleep and on TV. And I see these figures periodically, people watch two, three hours of TV, and you think, who's doing that? Not me. And then I stop and think about it. And then when the kids are in bed and you've done the washing up, then actually it's sort of nine o'clock in the evening you can sit down and start watching something. And my wife and I will quite often watch a couple of episodes of something. And then you think, oh, should I do another? And then of course it eats into your sleep. So mm -hmm. I'm certainly not getting nine hours, but then that's also because children are sort of yeah. leaping on our bed quite early. And I do think probably <laughs> the most amount of TV time in our house is Bluey. Oh, Bluey blue. is fantastic. I've been watching Bluey recently to try and learn Italian. I've been watching it in Italian and it is fantastic. <laughs> right. It's such a wholesome show. Yeah, it's yeah. so funny. But on, like, on the subject of children, why I'm slightly cynical of the statistics is apparently we've got those TV figures, but the average person spends 2.3 minutes a day supporting, comforting or cuddling children. Now, I don't know, is, does minutes? that ring true? Is that all? 2.3 minutes. Does that include people that don't even have children? I was thinking. <laughs> <That's> I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It would be odd if I was bringing that up. I think I'd give up, my yeah. kids more than a couple of minutes each. Yeah. And, and who set the stopwatch during that weird moment? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And also, 5.6 minutes checking or using social media. And oh. that really makes me think there's oh. something a afoot here. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, maybe it's the overlap with watching TV at the same time, right? Yeah, right. I'd easily clock up six hours on social media <laughs> if you count Twitter in that. It is terrifying. Look, let's stay on the topic of television because because the Christmas ads, they come out, we talk about them every year, it's all promotional, isn't it? And it's truly underway, Christmas, when those TV ads hit our screens. We've had m and setting fire to Christmas, John Lewis, now CGI present eating Venus flytrap, and Rick Astley in a Sainsbury's cheese aisle. Ever wondered how much all of this costs? Well, the Advertising Association says a record 9.5 billion quid will be spent during this Christmas season by uh, the retailers on these adverts. I'm an extraordinary high budget. It means a lot to them. It, it really does, because Christmas is the time where they are hoping to make all their money. You know, just last year, Marks and Spencer made £80 million on food, and that was their sales, on uh, December 23rd. 
one day. <laughs> it is a massive money spinner. And if you can use a Christmas advert to get people thinking that you are a British institution and you are, will not have a good Christmas unless you shop there, then it's probably a good deal. I mean, growing up, Christian, uh, it was a family tradition in my house that you go to the supermarket on the 24th in the evening and pick up all the yellow sticker <laughs> items for the weeks ahead. I mean, it, it's no surprise that there's a lot of money to be made in Christmas. It's big business. Um, these supermarkets all know that the 23rd of December is the busiest day of the year for them, food retailers. Uh, and they start planning for it in about August, um, not just cutting the adverts and designing the adverts in August. I think we were talking about the M&S Christmas ad this yes. time last week. Um, it's, and the stakes are very high. You know, mm. Tesco retains huge sort of 24% market share, I think. Um, m and is, is on the up. Um, John Lewis is, is having a pretty rubbish time. So the stakes yes. are, are very high. And, you know, People who are pouring over the state of our economy and the economic data are going to be banking on, you know, there's almost 10 billion quid that these companies and advertisers themselves will spend getting these pro their, their adverts out. Um, they'll be hoping, certainly in the Treasury, that, that it does encourage a consumer spending boom. But uh, for what it's worth, I, I think these adverts are all absolute dross. I thought they were oh. complete rubbish. And what on earth is John Lewis doing with uh, an operatic soundtrack <laughs> over a little shop of horrors Venus flytrap. I mean, were they smoking something in that meeting? I, it was completely okay. lost on me. Two words, TikTok. That's okay. what it's for. Oh, it's well, for you know what? There is one man standing by who might agree with you on all of that. That is, of course, Piers Morgan. He uh, often thinks that these types of adverts are dross. I want to ask you, Piers, have you seen the John Lewis ad? They're all utterly useless, <laughs> cringe-making, cheesy, saccharine, virtue-signalling, emotion-swaddling <laughs> nightmares. And that's the good one. <laughs> you always deliver, Piers. Come on, what's coming up on your show tonight? Well, we've got another big show about the Israel-Palestine war. We've got an amazing interview tonight with a Palestinian doctor who's also worked a lot in Israel, who's lost 22 members of his family in the troubles over the years, including many recently. It's going to be a very emotive, powerful interview. Indeed it will. Look, Piers Morgan Uncensored coming up next. Make sure you watch it. Thanks to Harry Kind and Christy May in the studio here with me tonight on Prime Time. That's all for us. We'll be back next week. People of Britain, do you fancy a good dose of common sense before bed? Because the Independent Republican Mike Graham is now in prime time. We still cover all the stories that matter and put the world to rights. We just do it a little bit later on. So don't miss the Independent Republican Mike Graham Monday to Thursday nights at 9 pm, right after Piers Morgan Uncensored. Yes, the revolution will be televised. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on at the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument, we tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah! <laughs> me and you conquer time. Who wins? Happens. You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? <laughs> I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous... What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I am Sanz. not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted new. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. and We're just asking patients to be patient with us. 
are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is our, where is our unbiased news 